welcome back to Astrology Alert because uh, I really enjoyed yes. the last conversation and I'm sure this one will be another great one because since we last spoke, so much has happened and there's so, oh. much, so much entertainment out there to focus on <laughs> in the political world. Uh, so, and we all have to give a big shout out, I think, to George Santos for providing some light relief in the misery and chaos and mayhem that is modern politics. You know. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true because, uh, but I think it's almost comical. What's your sense of, of him, by the way, in, in your readings? What do you sense is likely to happen to him? Uh, well, it's also, I don't know that I've actually read on him. He's always been, you know, a discussion starter rather than a, a subject. But my political instinct is um, he's just going to cling on. Every paycheck he gets is a sunny day for George Santos, you know. Mm. it's well, That's how he is. And now I saw today that the Dems are... Um, actually starting a process to have him evicted, I suppose, or whatever the term is. Yeah. And that'll yeah. throw the Republicans because they hate cooperating with the Dems and yet they need to get rid of him. Well, if that or the way things are going, it could also be the Department of Justice because there is yes. there's all the and there are all the inventions, but there is actual money that <laughs> they're trying to figure out where they got this money and it's looking pretty shady. And once there are transactions like that, mm, mm. it might not be too long you know, before they knock on his door and, and there's an actual charge or a threat of a charge or something like that. So, um, yes. And what have you, have you looked at his astrology? I, I looked at his day. I don't have a time, but from his day, uh, starting in the spring, Pretty much right around the solstice, things really change. They ramp up, and when mm -hmm. things ramp up, and you give them reason to, so to speak, oh. it's it's dangerous because uh, you know the planets aren't out to get you. It's what you do, and then you <laughs> give the planets a conduit. <laughs> so true. Yes. Yeah. So he's he's. I mean, he really. This guy just pushes the envelope. It's incredible. It's incredible mm -hmm. what he does. Although I thought it was pretty funny that. Um, Mitt Romney apparently, you know, gave him a piece of his mind and and George Santos replied back on the spot and also then followed up on social media insulting Romney by saying that he will never be president, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess Romney could now reply back and say, well, you'll never be human or you'll never be <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a normal person. So, yeah. What's the view? What do they think? This is a curiosity. What do they think in Australia of the of the American circus? You know, with with politics. Well, I think most Australians take note of the very big picture: who's now president, and some broad strokes. Um, I think people think I'm typical, and I'm really not. You know, of the detail that Australians follow it. But we do have an issue because, you know, the old joke here is if America sneezes, the world gets a cold. So we've mm -hmm. always been involved um, following in America's footsteps and we have been into every military engagement with America since the Second World War. That's true. You know, right through Vietnam, the Coalition of the Willing, all of it. Craziness. So we are sort of involved. Yeah. No. Not that no. Americans would know or care. Which yeah. is why it's particularly stupid. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in a way it's understandable, though it's it's a shared world view. It it is it is there. This the you could call it Western style democracy, something. Um that I still share something. At the same time, New Zealand doesn't do it. New Zealand very cleverly paddles its own canoe. So during, um, you know, the invasion of Iraq and all of that stuff, New Zealand said, we will not send troops, we will send medical aid. Mm -hmm. Good on them. Right, right, right. You know, right. 
Um, and they also banned nuclear-powered ships back in the 80s. It was a very big deal. Hmm. And so they've always had the courage to stand alone. And they're only 5 million people. Yeah, well, you know, the thing with these things, though, is that everything has a benefit and everything has a problem. And mm. so when you side with the U.S., you take on the U.S.'s problems, but then the U.S. Mm. is more likely to to help you and to include you and so forth. So I'm sure it's quite a catch-22 that way. But Yeah, it is a trade-off. But we're not handling it particularly well because the world has shifted. So post-war, that was the natural alliance, if you like, because of each sharing the Pacific in colonial terms. But now our biggest trading partner is China. So to keep poking the dragon in the eye is not the smartest of foreign policies. That's true. Yeah, it's true. I, I you know, and our foreign policy hasn't caught up with that. Yeah, no. So it creates, it creates a real dilemma. For mm. sure. Yeah, well, I totally understand that. Yeah. So then, and so then they're not. So in, in Australia, you, you won't see in the news like George Santos is like an afterthought then, or you know, the specific characters. They don't focus on that too much. It's more that Biden is. Yeah, they would know his name. They'd know what he's famous for, which is we would say a rat bag, you know, just like that. Um, <laughs> they would recognise probably Marjorie Taylor Greene and a few other big personalities. Mm. But that's about it, yeah. Is, is she one, she, someone you've covered in your, in your um, attunement? In your well, I, in my next video I'm going to because, again, for maybe six months or a year, it's like, oh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said this, did that. And they're so disgusting that you almost don't want to touch their energy, you know. <laughs> they're so... But I think I'm overdue for a Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's remarkable, though, that that we're living through this because it, this these characters years ago were so fringe, so outside the norm that they didn't get any airspace and now it's it's just it's dominant they they've managed to to get themselves in a place where they're front and center although tell me what you think i suspect that it may be better for the presidential election in 24 that the house of representatives is being run in this way because it can't be run in any other way because of the numbers and it puts on full display the fact that they're not really interested in governance. They're not good at that. They're interested in chaos and in tearing things yes. down. And so then that doesn't really sit well with the larger majority, even though there may be many people that... Um, yes, it's you know. true. I, I think you'd have to hope it's going to play out in that fashion. This is a preview of what you get, which is chaos and nothing moving forward. No, it, no one is actually governing. Yeah. They're not even pretending to govern. But I think there's a, a bigger thing at stake here, which is how the fundamentalist Christians have co-opted the space of patriotic America. Not a great point. Now, again, they always were a voice, but probably not more than 25%. Most people chose to live in a secular America. You know, um, church attendance was dropping off as it is in all Western countries. Uh, it was a nod to uh, the conventions that went before. And now this real time war, this, and I think Biden, who did a fabulous job the other night, but needs to keep hammering this home. They're taking the country back 200 years by this behaviour. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And the thing is, it's, as I see it, it's really hard to do because the generation that may still connect that way is aging and do to disappear. And you can try, you know, it's funny to talk about indoctrination. That's one of their things. Oh, you're indoctrinating our children. Well, you can indoctrinate them with your theories, but they're really hard to, to establish. Once you have the internet, the internet is a big problem for fascists yes. and uh, any anyone trying to fool the masses 
en masse. It's difficult mm. to do, uh, including for China and Russia. It, it, it makes things so much more complicated. A lot of what these horrible regimes have done in the past is horrible things and then they hide them and then they don't come to light for decades sometimes. But now it's a lot tougher. Yes. You know, so. And lest we forget what America did to the whole of Latin America in the 70s and 80s in terms of controlling media and sure. deliberate misinformation campaigns mm. and so forth. So this is an old tactic. It's just the mechanism is now universal. The mechanism is universal. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah. How, yeah. How do you see the, uh, how do you see the uh, Ukraine war, that conflict, the US involvement, Putin, where all of that is going? Well, you'd have to think Ukraine is not going to lose this war regardless of what happens at this point. It's extraordinary uh, how strongly the people have come back from other places who have stood their ground. Uh, they're not going to lose. However, a lot of destruction can take place. Yeah, it's, it's happening. Before right. that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But I'd be interested what you think too there's a deep irony to this that Russia has not only lost the publicity war because no one noticed or cared when they annexed Crimea, Crimea or all the Stans, Kazakhstan, Turkis, Turkmenistan, any of the Stan, no one batted an eyelid and it was different this time round. But ironically, how do you see Russia after all this well i i view it through through the leader uh, there there are some charts for russia itself it gets a little confusing because to me it almost feels like the original chart the chart that was in play when the soviet union mutated makes more sense uh, in reflecting today's pattern uh -huh. and people who create these other charts saying no no this other new thing started in 1990 and I look at that one and it there's nothing moving there that that makes any sense so if I look at the the uh, original Soviet Union chart and then assume things really haven't transformed that much because they've gone back in a way to a an authoritarian approach in mm -hmm. fact they they can accuse the US of being an empire but that's what they're trying to do as well in some fashion and so that would explain why these years have been so difficult for Russia and why they're not winning. Uh, but then viewed through Putin, it's not good because his, his chart is very misaligned. And so mm -hmm. uh, he had his opportunity. If you look at his chart, when Trump was coming into power, which makes a lot of sense, he was really riding high. Trump and Putin were united. For a while there, it seemed that Putin was more in charge of the free world than, than yes. Trump. Yes, Trump was. Yes was saying, you know, I trust Putin and I trust no one else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but now it's not the same. It's not well aligned and it, it's tending to get worse as the months and years pass. And one of the things that's there and it's been thrown around and no one knows 100% if it's true, but the health factor, it's very possible that Putin has a health problem because there's health all over that chart. You can see it, you know, so mm. uh, based on that, it's possible that Putin may be exiting or changing or leaving or some such thing. And what what's your sense if there were a, a change of leadership, does it feel to you like another Putin-esque, you know, character or worse would would then take over or would it be something? I'm afraid so. That's uh, my take on it. It's like I think there's a naivety in the West. You know, you get rid of the bad guy and things will get better. Uh, I only see um, someone the same or worse. But I think it's like their second to last incarnation towards real political modernisation. Uh, Does that make sense? You yeah, know what I mean? I think Putin will go one way or another. There'll be some hideous person trying to keep people down, but they'll have had enough after X years of that. I don't think it's going to go another generation, put it that way. Huh. And it, it, would you say, though, that, because here's the thing, in, in the astrology, there's some risk of some pretty major conflict 
involving the U.S. because we're going toward years that are pretty exact in mirroring the Second World War major conflict period and the and the Civil War period, although for separate reasons, different reasons, because mm-hmm. they were more internal. And then even the founding of the U.S. was something that happened through conflict. They were actually in, in battle mm-hmm. with the U.K. to get out and so forth. So this is the the fourth visit of that particular planet. And you start to think, hmm, there's China making, no, you know, the balloons. Like, what if, you know, <laughs> something like that. Or you think immediately Russia because... Russia is, in the end, you know, they're armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And although it's a very small economy relative to the Western world, it's it can't compete. And that's probably the major reason I don't see how they can win because you run out of resources, you know, to to eventually, or at least you're Absolutely. very short of resources. And Russia's economy, be, even before the sanctions, even before this war, it's not a big economy. It has this no. giant personality. I think I read somewhere a few years ago, it's roughly the same size of economy as Sweden. Yeah, I heard it. And we bit. don't see Sweden as a global threat for a whole range of other. But no. that sort of puts it in perspective. So if you add now years of sanctions. Right. Um, and so the economy must be on its knees. Yeah, I mean, in, in numbers that I've heard, it's two trillion, and the European Union, all of it, is twenty trillion, and another twenty trillion from the U.S. That's a forty trillion dollar alliance, and yes. China, China, which I think is at around fifteen trillion, is not really aligned. They're not doing a major alliance with Russia because because they're scared of the U.S. market. You know, there's a there's an interdependency there. Mm. Um, so I don't think they're interested in. They, I think they would want to back the winner, but since Putin, you know, and by the way, this exposes pretty clearly that, you know, these systems where they, they, they try to convince their people that it's a better way to live, to be in this top-down mm-hmm. arrangement, but when it comes down to actually doing something, they can't do it because they're not organized well. Um, you know, I mean, this, this, yes. should have been, this should not have happened, you know, to enter a war and have this many things um, turn out to be different than what they thought. You know, the planning seems terrible. And, and so... Right. Not, but I think it wouldn't have crossed Putin's mind or even the generals of the time that this would be as prolonged as it is. Well, I true. thought true. at the time, oh, they think they're going to swan in and it'll all be over in a week. And in another scenario, that might have happened. Right. Ukraine might have capitulated and, and so forth. But no one actually appreciated that depth to the Ukrainian will for right. its own identity. Although you wonder, though, you wonder why, in a way that this was, I remember Putin back in the day say, you know, saying that George W. Bush had made a political mistake going into Iraq, which was ultimately true. But Absolutely. the problem with that wasn't winning the war pretty quickly. The U.S. had scouted what needed to be done, and that was not a problem. The problem was then holding on to the country and so forth. But this to me is, it's like a lack of information. It's not knowing what is really happening. This country is next to you. What does it take to figure out whether or not they're going to resist? I mean, yes, exactly. I and the arrogance right. of thinking they could just roll in is breathtaking. In them. But this is what happens, of course, with authoritarian regimes. People do not give the leader of those regimes factual information or information they don't want to hear. You know. But I think the other it was a two-pronged thing. One was the will of the Ukrainian people. But to be completely honest, I doubt that would have been enough. He expected that Trump had weakened NATO and NATO would dither and not know how to respond. And the opposite happened. Like immediately the NATO country started talking, started cooperating. And one of the deep and abiding ironies of all this is it brought NATO back to life. Yeah. You could argue it was on life support prior to the Ukraine invasion. Yes. And then, of course, you have Sweden and Finland lobbying to get into NATO, which was his worst fear. This was all allegedly done to, you know, 
keep the borders NATO free. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's entirely true. And, and uh, there was an article today in the New York Times where the person make, tries to make the case that the U.S. is getting too involved and that it ostensibly now it's a, it's a war between the U.S. and Russia and that Russia cannot afford to lose the war because that's their only way out of the, to protect their country. It's, it's the, the usual argument that they need the, the, the Black Sea for security, that the, this entire landmass has no exit to the south. You know, and I think to myself, well, who wants to invade Russia? What, what is this thinking about? Yes, it's a yeah. non-starter. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total BS argument. I mean, as soon as you start there, how do I even make any sense of that? No one wants to invade Russia. For what purpose? What? No. So they, there's no, no purpose at all. <laughs> so, so you almost have to say, no, really, it's because you want to have a gateway into invading other countries, you know, to... Yes, to that's, that's really and what's going on. I think the other thing is always the American gaze is always US centric in the sense if America hadn't done anything at all, I think Ukraine would be in the position it's in today and handling it as well because of what I just said about NATO. Suddenly, 20 countries came to the immediate rescue of Ukraine and are taking the displaced Ukrainians and everything else that's involved with the hideous war. True. It's great that America has stepped up, but it's not a deciding factor. Well, there I, I, I feel like, you know, Biden had a big, big role in that he was the immediately he, he went to Europe, he talked to the Germans because the Germans were kind of, oh, I don't know if we want to get involved. And he, I think whatever he said, <laughs> got them on board. So, I mean, yeah. bottom line, NATO Which is, is what, yeah, it's yeah. the alliance. It's the alliance. So, so it, it's, it's great that, that everyone is, is on board with, with it. Yeah, you know, and so and then and thank God it was Biden and not the other one. Well, he wouldn't have done it. I mean, that's the thing that no. he he's saying Putin wouldn't have invaded. Putin would have invaded and he would have helped him. That's what's really sad about this. He would have said yeah. it's not our business. You know, they're fighting over land and like what he did to the Kurds. You know, Kurds had helped the U.S. and he just left them. You know, and they lost their their. Their, their land and their property, and he didn't care. So why would he care about the Ukrainians? He was already angry at them for not getting the support he wanted, you know, to find dirt on Biden and whatever else he was doing there. So he wasn't very friendly to the Ukrainians. But he'll say whatever he needs to say to to create a political message, and, you know, he doesn't care. So, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I back to Putin, that's what, what do you see? That's what I see that he, I don't think is, prospects are good at all you know from how no, already i don't think it's a future thing i think already he is hugely compromised behind the scenes mm. um i think it's it's a medieval court isn't it in some ways so anyone who brings bad news falls out a window or off the back of a boat and you know <laughs> all the stuff but in my lifetime i have never seen the Russian oligarchs speak out on Western media the way they have. That is new to me. One after the other after the other. You can't put on CNN or MSNBC without seeing another disgruntled oligarch who are taking personal risks it's true. by it's speaking. True. Yeah, it's totally true. It's probably because I, it, it can happen that when someone is downtrending, they lose their they lose their magic and then people start to, to take shots. But it, it, it's, I don't know that I would call it, is it courageous? Is it daring? It's risky though. It's risky because uh, his regime doesn't like it and they're pretty aggressive with, with No, and what is actually motivating them, of course, let's not dress it up too much as personal curry. It's about, you can't, they're killing the golden goose and they can't make these vast individual fortunes in an unstable, depleted Russia. True. Oh. It's true. Yeah. yeah. So it is a self-serving position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is still a degree you've got to hand it to them because you know nothing's off limits, including wives and children and everything else. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's just why, I mean, I tilt, I... I... What's your sense? I mean, personally, do you feel like uh, how should it be or how do you see the whole thing that, that Russia should be more democratic? I mean, presumably, right? That... 
Okay, let me take a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> we use this word, the D word, democracy, like, poof, you know, that's the holy grail of human organisation is this thing called democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not always the very best idea, <laughs> you know. Right. True. Um, and so I have to preface what I want to say with that. Now, for a democracy to work, you need certain pillars in place. You, you need a good public education system. You need an independent court system. You need an independent media. Mm -hmm. And you need a functional opposition. Right. And the key being the peaceful transition of power. Those are the tenets of a working democracy. And you will notice by those, if you look quickly, America's losing a lot of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, probably three or four out of the five are under fire, you know, with global media being purchased with a very dodgy Supreme Court. When your Supreme Court cannot be trusted implicitly to serve the people, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We know what's happening to education. So there's a double message here. Right. Back to Russia really hasn't had a democracy. It, it had an experiment in democracy under Gorbachev and <laughs> stuff for a minute. Mm -hmm. But it's not an entrenched way of being. True. It's true. It's true. 100%. Absolutely true. So yeah. the problem is, and why so many developing countries struggle with democracy, is it's a winner-take-all. It might be a notional democracy, but it's a winner-take-all scenario. If you win, you're in power and all your corrupt family and friends and cronies are in power, everyone else is in jail, and then it might flip, you know. <laughs> but it's not a working democracy. Correct. Yeah. So in answer to your question, I think Russia's a long way from having a healthy democracy. Yeah, yeah, well, and then uh, you also said it, it may not be a whole generation. It's just that at some point, they would do well, in my opinion, to move in that direction because they can be part oh, of the yeah. world instead of being at odds with the world and, and they would cease to be, as John McCain put it, a gas station with an army, you know, because yes. they're yes. dependent on, on natural gas and oil, which are probably over the years going to become less of a factor and so even if they continue using them it would become cheaper because there would be too much of it uh, assuming that you know mm -hmm. the energy the energy um, uh, sources improve and so and so forth so question is when they'll do that but i think it would be good for them and good for the world uh, if they did uh, absolutely and if we could fast forward to the end of the ukrainian conflict and the rebuilding and look at Russia's intergenerational um, split over this issue of the occupation. You know, it's under 40s are not on board, over 40s still consuming state news, right? There's a rough split. So it is a numbers game. And I think, ironically, Ukraine will inspire and lead young Russians into something they can recognise with the language overlaps and so forth, something they could recognise as a possibility and a reality mm -hmm. that under other circumstances they may not have. So in the bigger picture, I'm optimistic about this question. I really am. That's good. That's good. And I mean, this is the thing, when you mentioned democracy, you're, you're totally correct, in my opinion, around countries not being ready for democracy or mm. perhaps if they are. So this tells you that the consequence of the Soviet Union period did not prepare Russia for that because there are countries where they can move from a more authoritarian uh, system of government and then move into democracy. They have that quality already in the people enough mm. to bring that about and not so in Russia. But overall, you know, democracy I think it's worth defending because if you look at the systems that are that are there, you know, I, I agree with Winston Churchill. I mean, it's the worst thing you can do except for all the rest. 
I mean, what, what else can exactly. we do? Exactly. That's my have? final position yeah. as well. Yeah. I just think we tend to use it in a very unquestioning way. Right. right. That it's this simple thing, you announce you're a democracy and then everything flows from that. Right, right. And it's not, unless it has all those other things in place. Right. Yeah, because exactly, because for example, like you'd be saying, you set up a democracy, you have to be courageous enough to allow a free press to yes. criticize you, to say, look, you're not yes. doing this well, so yes. that everybody, right, exactly, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. In these places where they, they control the press, it can never thrive, because then it starts there, by the way, where it gets bad for them, where it falls apart, is that then, what you said earlier, that then you reach a point where his own people won't tell him what's going on, because they're scared. Well, if I say to him, this is a stupid idea to invade Ukraine, he'll throw, you know, throw me off a balcony which is so no i'm just gonna yes. yeah yeah it's a good idea let's go in and you know <laughs> and see what exactly. happens yeah um, absolutely i don't think indonesia just to leap to the other side of the world gets enough credit for its democracy mm. right? it came out of an authoritarian regime it's the biggest muslim population outside of the middle east it has 240 million people probably more since I looked up those stats, right? It's impressive, very impressive. Very it has violence-free elections. It has a very good public education system. It has an excellent healthcare system. Um, and who talks about Indonesia? You're yeah. right. You're right that I, I I know it's a country that I keep in the background. But I, for, for instance, I didn't know that the 240 million. I thought it was less. So that's that's really impressive. 240 yeah. million is and they really really sizable. Doing it. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, that's the thing with democracy. You get the combination of people having a lot more freedom, but at the same time, you can't give them a total. You know latitude to do whatever they want then in a way they're trying to be kings and so you're you're mm. you're denying the true impulse of democracy which is to to share the the energy in some sense even if if almost all democracies operate out of capitalism so there's that incentive to make money and become more wealthy and and, and so forth but if you if you uh, lose the balance then i think in a sense you could almost predict what happened in the U.S. when when Reagan came into into power in 1980, and he started to tilt the balance toward the rich. So now there's more inequality. That's where you get into a risk of this, where then fascism starts to to uh, you know creep in potentially because it's really those people that are interested in. It. I mean, why why would the Republican Party be the party that seems to be okay with the idea oh. of having a a top down thing? Because a lot of the votes that are coming through aren't even for uh, the idea of democracy or not. It's because of low taxes and leave my wealth alone and I just want to be able to do whatever I want, which is which is one of the ways. Yeah, that... I think there's also a unique um, sort of, no, subculture is the wrong word, but it's sort of of the right in the sense the American national narrative carries all before it. So by that I mean uh, even if I'm nursing my dead baby because I can't afford health care, they're not going to take my guns. So as long as you have this perverse alliance of the working class with the employer maximum profit class, um, I don't think Americans can actually see their way clear to actually make the other demands on their democracy that are necessary. So sure. it's not yeah. just about asking for the vote. It's about insisting on good education, not picking up the crumbs, not letting the flat earthers educate your children. <laughs> it's about doing something about a patently compromised Supreme Court. It's all these other things that I started the conversation with it's not just about the fact. It's true. No, it's totally true. It's totally true. I mean, the only thing I can say on the optimistic side is that so far, even with the chaos and the threats and so forth, democracy is still speaking because you saw what happened in the last election. They, yeah, absolutely. More they, 
the more they promote people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, indirectly George Santos, people like that, the, the more you're likely to lose elections. You know, Car Carrie Lake's approach, she thought she would win because, because of her yeah. media savvy, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't enough. Now, she's not losing by much, but that's also democracy. And democracy, thriving democracies, if you get a 60-40 split, it's considered an overwhelming landslide. So yes. sometimes you'll win 52-53. It's good enough. It tells you that the majority is still speaking. And in the U.S., you know, 350 million. This means many millions. Well, and that you saw the in Biden, uh, Trump was what, 8 million, I think, the difference, or 7 or 8 million. Mm. So, you know, it's sizable. It's not, it's, this, it's disturbing to think that 75 million would vote for that. Absolutely. Idiot. You can't think I mean, about that last thing at night. <laughs> but, <I know. laughs> but I take your point. Um, but I think it's like you were saying at the beginning, it's like the fourth cycle of this stuff. This generation of Americans, our peers who were post-war and so weren't expecting to have to fight for the very premise of democracy, you know, until, you know, it's true. 2016, it's true. really. And yeah. so if people step up, I think it can be very healthy the people go, phew, that was a near miss. Now I'm going to make sure I'm on my local school board that this doesn't happen. I'm going to make sure I vote when before I couldn't be bothered. You know, there can be, I think America's due for a really positive pendulum swing. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. Sure. And I, I think to at least to some extent it's happening because yep, you can see it in the numbers. I, I remember yeah. in the, in the uh, Trump administration, the pattern that, would repeated itself since as soon as he entered office by 2017 and then 2018, 2019, you'd see these elections that were supposed to be Republican uh, strongholds. And mm -hmm. what would happen is more Republicans were voting and then even more Democrats were voting. So they, he, he was yes. stimulating a defensive reaction in the in the electorate, which and again, it happened in the in the uh, general election, too, because he got a lot more votes. I think that's what was playing tricks with his mind because he couldn't understand how could I get more votes than Barack Obama and still lose to someone like Joe Biden? <laughs> because, mm. because you know why? Because he's actually smarter than you, you <laughs> clown. But anyways, he couldn't figure it out. But th there was a tremendous overvote. And so this tells you that people are paying attention. The question is, can they, can they stay paying attention? And this is where I was thinking that it may be a blessing to have this group in the House of Representatives because they're they're just yes. determined. They're determined to to choose the wrong political message. I don't know if you ever see Joe Scarborough, who's an ex Republican, and he's one yes, of the most savvy. Do, and, you know, yeah. I keep saying these Republicans just they're determined to lose elections because they they keep doing the same thing, and they promote you know causes that don't get you votes. They get you losses, right? <laughs> Yeah, go I think that. Joe Scarborough's voice is really symbolic, i.e. middle of the road, born Republicans, never thought they'd deviate, who have had to separate themselves from this GOP. So that is a really important voting body. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's true. And probably enough to tip the scales, you know, in this. It's very true. true. It's very, and even though, you see, even though uh, your opinion on this would be really welcome, there are uh, those who say now that Trump is like the, he's like the virus that now started a, the disease, Trumpism. So even if he isn't there, some other person will, will carry on the message. But I think that he is the primary cause because the fact that he is there means that someone like DeSantis has to also be Trumpy to be competitive, let's say, in the next election. Whereas if he's not there, it might start things, you know, it might start to calm everybody down and let them focus more on winning, which is what they want to do. Mm. As it is now, I mean, I don't know how you see DeSantis, by the way, what his, what, what's your yeah. sense of DeSantis? <laughs> he's weird, isn't he? But I agree with what you were just saying. It's actually... Um, I'll come to DeSantis in a minute, but 
it's true that even if Trump do- dropped dead next Wednesday, Trumpism is here for now. But this is what happens with charismatic leaders. Other people push their line, but it doesn't work right. the same way. The same way. Right. It's a particular personality cult. Right. You know? right. Right. So let it play out. You know? Yeah. Well, but DeSantis, yeah. Ah, it's so hard to get a handle on the man, isn't it? You know? So why he feels he has to be this extreme, I actually don't understand DeSantis. And that's not a sentence you hear from me often. I always have an opinion on everything. But I can't quite get my hand around. Now, in terms of just statistics, Florida and Floridians are huge consumers of the benefit system you know it's snowbird country it's people go there to retire and ultimately shuffle off the mortal coil right Mm -hmm. huge thing so biden full marks to him managed to say what he did about that but why this antipathy to education in such a crude fascist way I don't understand what what what's going on. I'll ask you what's going on with DeSantis. I, I think we, I think DeSantis is in the same fix, the same jam that Trump has put everybody in in that party because they the the base the the group that they absolutely must have in order to win the election is so intoxicated in the wrong way with with mm-hmm. these, these you know this garbage that has been put out there that he is forced to get into the culture wars, take those positions, which can mean you could win primaries, you could win, get all Mm. the way to the nomination and so forth. But then you have to deal with the full electorate. And then what you said kicks in, which is most people don't want those benefits changed. Most people want good education for their children. Most people want, you know, the, the, the broader picture. And so then once again, they're maneuvering themselves into a, a, a position of loss. I actually think if that's, what the choice will be, and I'm not sure because it's pretty early in, in politics mm-hmm. to change pretty quickly. But uh, I don't see Trump going anywhere in terms of his political life, in terms of any of the rest. His his chart is just downtrending into all hell. And DeSantis is no better. He's a Virgo. He's going into this election. Saturn on the other side. That's what happened to McCain. He lost to to um, Obama. Saturn opposite years. The, it's too hard. You have to be mm. Houdini to, to pull that off. And and you can see why that would be the case, because he's not a, a terrible governor when he just governs. When he first came into... into yeah, but it was just, you know... Yeah, it didn't last long. Not I mean, the like, worst of the worst. Well, you remember that... Uh, this, is the, this is what's really amazing, that it used to be that if a politician did an about-face, people would say, oh, flip-flopper and, you know, turn them off. Mm. This guy was advocating for vaccines and saying yes. to take them and they're good. Now, oh, we're going to investigate vaccines and we're going to create, you know, all sorts of things to uh, find the, the COVID this and the COVID. You know, all of that is because of the base, because he knows mm-hmm. that that group of people to this day is against vaccines. There's where I, I see that as the, the inmates took charge of the of the prison because Absolutely. Trump himself, Trump himself, you remember Trump kept saying, no, no, don't wear any masks, don't do anything. We have this great vaccine coming that I'm bringing in. He was doing nothing of the sort, but that was his political message. He yeah. certainly took the vaccines and the boosters and all the rest. But quite a while back, he was booed off the stage when he said to his followers. Yes, yeah, they have they- claimed this perverse domain around vaccines. And don't tell me. Tucker Carlson and all of those aren't fully vaccinated. Oh, of course, of course they are. Of course, of course. And this is the thing, though. This is where I, you know, I always think, okay, in the end, the universe, I see the universe as ultimately as a as a good creative place. I choose to be optimistic. And mm-hmm. they, there's got to be karmic payback when you are doing something and telling people the opposite. That is just not good. I'm sorry, but it is horrible that a person can be doing that like Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, and then putting these thoughts in people's minds because people follow the media and they follow their leaders. It's a fact, you know, among mm-hmm. many millions. This is why, the, it, speaking of Trump, the fact that he's there is a big problem because many people are, are still looking to him. It amazes me why, but 
some <laughs> yes. no seriously i mean i'm completely yeah. amazed and you know you said earlier that you said that the generation post war how they're wondering well, what happened here we, th mm. we thought we had this covered well it almost feels like the people in that generation that have common sense that are halfway decent are battling all the people in that generation that are not that way they're, they're the so-called yes. because that's really what it is it's the people that are that age that are causing the problem mm. from that very group it's almost and like they're they, not just unemployed young men or anything like that there, there is some very strange and revealing demographic that is at the MAGA heartland you know right, right. It, it's like this pride in their ignorance you know that is extraordinary you know they carry all before them yes you know uh, is, is this by the way does this so does any of this uh manifest in where you live in any way in other words to, to yeah say for sure we've got anti-vaxxers and you know magophiles etc etc however they are still only a tiny proportion of the population. So Australia has an 80% plus fully vaccinated mm. um, as a nation statistic. Um, people religiously go for their top-ups and so forth. There's a handful of people who left the police force because they wouldn't get vaccinated or a couple of nurses who wouldn't, you know, who you think, really? You haven't really looked at this very well. But the numbers aren't frightful and they're not tipping the scale. Right, right. But they're still there. So, and, and is it, is it a, uh, would you say it's approximately concurrent with what appears to be, in some ways, a worldwide problem? Because, you know, Trump rose at the same time as Bolsonaro and then, uh, absolutely, absolutely, and caught that right wing, far right wave, which offers really simplistic solutions for your life not working, right? <laughs> so well put. Well put. <laughs> it's hugely attractive, right? You know, um, and I grew up in a police state. I grew up in Queensland under a guy called Bielke Peterson. He was a Trump before Trump, right? Uh, huh. He spoke in word salads, complete gobbledygook, you know, rubbish sentences. People loved him. Every six months he'd say, we're going to secede from the rest of Australia. Yes, he's our guy, you know. And people mistake grumpiness, belligerence, strident nose as strength. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very primitive brain reflex or something <laughs> that if someone just goes, no, they go, he's strong, <laughs> when in fact he couldn't comprehend the nuance of politics. So because he kept getting elected, we were the laughing stock of Australia for 20 years, right? Yeah. This went on all through my childhood. He turned it in literally into a police state. You could be arrested for anything, not go to court, just get beaten up in the cells, convicted by, you know, kangaroo courts. It was just, it was actually really serious and really bad, right? Yeah. But people loved this man. Loved him, you know? What, what percentage was it? What, what was? Do you think that? Well, we have were... compulsory voting, so more than fifty percent got him in every time there was an election, and each incarnation would be more fascist. So ah. we had a situation where um, one guy, Russ Hines, was known as the minister for everything because he kept getting given portfolios, police gambling you know <laughs> everything else you know that okay. developers got given culture like jerry, <laughs> like jerry Kushner, right? he was doing everything <laughs> yeah and it was really really bad and the rest of australia were aware of it but like i said it was a joke thing but it played on all those same primordial tribal affiliations so it was all about being a Queenslander. Right. You weren't an Australian, you were a Queenslander. And there'd be huge billboards saying things like, 
you can count on a Queenslander. Like, there's any meaning to that statement? You know, it's just lunacy. But this was the propaganda. Yeah. We were different. We were superior to everyone else in Australia. Yeah. So I've seen it and I've felt it on the ground, you know, and I've watched the success of this rubbish talk. People loved it. They lapped it up. And he was totally corrupt. Didn't matter. He was proven to be corrupt over and over. No, he's just smart. All the same tenets of Trumpism. It's correct, yeah. It's correct. And the, the incredible, the, uh, I don't know how I was working with this guy, but he was winning, which is a different thing because Trump is... Is, is a not winning. Loser. Yes, that's right. So the thing that people don't understand about Trump, and if there's a, you know, in the highly unlikely event that a Trumper is watching this, I'm speaking to you to say, you know, he doesn't care if he wins or loses because if he wins, he wins, which he's not going to, he's going to lose. But then he'll just ask you for money by telling you that he lost unfairly. And you yeah, yeah, said yeah. that to him, and it's remarkable to me. How stupid can you be? I mean, the man's it's figured sad. it out. He's figured it out. Doesn't matter. I'll just say it was rigged. They, they, now give me money so I can totally, fight back. Totally. <laughs> it's all been exposed, but not in their silos. And so now they've got to protect him because he's being attacked. But I suspect the actual numbers are dwindling, which is yeah. why the modern GOP is in a losing strategy, because what was a full 25%, if you think that half of Americans who are eligible don't vote, so he got in on a quarter of the vote, yeah. Reagan got in on 26% of the vote. We forget that. You know, right? right, 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 exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is the American pattern. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that numbers have dropped off just either because he failed to deliver or they've just got bored with the, you know, dog and pony show. It doesn't have to be highbrow political dissension. It just be, oh, well, you know, I'm bored. Numbers must have dropped. So therefore, they're going with all guns blazing after what's left. I'm going to make up a stat. 16 to 20% would be magazine. If you just look at that statistical drop off he he didn't gain votes over his presidency he did not gain voters right so we've got to look at that original figure and then look at losing elections since then so the numbers have to be going down so they're chasing their tails that's right it. yeah that's true it's true they, they they have a they've had a uh if you look at the numbers going back to about 2010, they're always in a four or five percent deficit. So that if more of them vote Republican, then that four percent just gets uh, made up by more Democrats. And you always see that that difference. And really, when you think about it, he won in 2016, and many people call it an inside straight. It's like getting all the cards landing precisely. Yes, uh, yes. He, and he he knew this. The one thing about Trump is he's he does know what the problem is. And that's why he was so worried about Biden. He was sure Biden would be the anti-Trump uh, you know, candidate and he would win Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Michigan. And that was the way he won the presidency, Trump did. So and that's exactly what happened. Once he lost those three, he lost a little more, but those three were critical. So he knew this. So in reality, they're short votes. They've been short votes for a long time. And that's why they're constantly so desperate to suppress the vote, because they know if you allow everyone to vote properly, there aren't enough votes for them because mm. they're, they're effectively now they're a minority party until they start to you know, meet the requirements of people as they are today, not as they would in the 17th century or in the, even the 20th century. We're in the 21st exactly. century. You and know, you have to adapt. half of his appeal rolls over to this hard right GOP, which is, you know, keeping guns, not even looking at it, anything, you know, da 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 the, the culture wars. But the other side, none of which was Trump's ideas, right? You know, um, by that I mean um, the forgotten Americans type thing, as if a New York billionaire who'd never left Queens except to go to Florida identified with a steel worker in the Ross Belt, like rubbish. But it was 
Paul Manafort, who said, tell them they're the forgotten people, you know, Bannon said, tell them you build the wall, you know. So those key elements did not come to pass. You know, he didn't bring back coal and steel and anything else and the wall has not been built. So that's what I mean about there has to be a dwindling, leaving only the hard core. And now the evangelicals aren't that comfy sure. because, you know, you've brought your kids up, if nothing else, to be respectful and polite, you know, and all of that stuff. And you had this lecherous buffoon and they spent five years saying, well, you know, it's not for us to judge and, you know, he's giving us all this other stuff. They're actually not that comfortable with his vulgarity. Sure, absolutely. And and for good reason. <laughs> I mean, even, well, yeah. even, even if even if I, I'm not an evangelical and I don't share their cause there either, but I think, yeah, that's just common sense. I mean, do you really want your child to see this this, this cockroach, this beast, the way he yeah. behaves? This is the yeah. example he's setting. You know, a Bulgarian, first class Bulgarian. <laughs> Absolutely. So, oh, yeah. Okay. So, what, what's your, uh, what, what, what's the takeaway? What do you, if you had to summarize the, say, 2023 with all these patterns, what would you say about America, oh. Europe, the, where, where the world is going in 20? Oh, there's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think, because I think 2024, is very big, you know, I'm sure astrologically as well as, you know, in pure political terms. Sure. This is a really important year. This is not a year for people to disengage. And my mantra that I try to say to people is find your passion in some political domain you could be a keyboard warrior, you could volunteer once a month or once a week for something, or you could, as a grandparent, join a school board to counter those people or something. Find something you can do because there are more decent people than not. Good point. So that's in the American context. In the global context, I think China's having its first big shake up since modern China was born. It's got a long history with plenty of shake ups, but in terms of what we understand as modern China. And so it embraced what was actually quite a clever um, experiment with capitalism while retaining a one party state. And they managed that very, very well for 20 years or so, complete control of the population, but allow people to make a fortune, lift millions into a recognizable middle class. But now they've come to their first big impasse. So if you look at the distribution of wealth in China, it's all around the coast. In inland, no. Right. Mm. So it's coming to grips like the West had that post-World War II boom, literally boom. What made that successful? Big governments, not small governments, big governments. Exactly. exactly. Stable employment, blah, 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 blah. And so how China handles it I think will be massively influential on the world. I really, really do think that. I think India's a sleeper. India is quite well educated generically if you look across the board. Again, you've got the youth culture mix. So it's where do young people fit in their countries and as part of global youth culture. Right. And right. I think this is where social media, I think, has a huge role to play. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So then and, and you, your feeling is that, so they're critical it, uh and would they, because China, what I've heard is that they're running into economic problems through some of the, some of the, the way they've done things. In, in well, they are massively running into problems, but I think they're less likely to tolerate the excuses for that. Like they are lazy. Most young people I know are working 60 hours a week. They can't afford to rent or buy and they're struggling. They're not happy with that. They've been sold 
part of the Australian dream or the American dream or the, the anything. Look at the UK. The UK is on the brink of becoming an absolutely, um, you know, fourth, fifth tier state, you know, from pursuing these hard right policies. So will young people rise up and demand more of their politicians or not? Will they go under with the oppression and exhaustion and the feelings of powerlessness? So I think that's what the point of engagement is. Will young people bucket and demand more or will they just go under dragging their countries with them? Not their fault, but because no one is standing up to these outrageous, profit-driven not particularly democratic regimes that form, you know, the majority of the West. It's true. Yeah, that's the thing is whether or not we can navigate through the transition because I, I my sense is that... The transition, we can this agree is on not, that. Like, it's not going to... I don't think this will clear itself up right away. I think I think this decade, this whole decade is a... Yes, I agree. ...transitional decade and we have to get used to the idea that we have to stay on it and and work toward uh, the new the new order that will emerge, but not without going through a bit of a, a bit of a tussle. Uh, let's Absolutely, that's how I would see it. But yeah. I have fundamental faith in good people, and so it's really important. And I think we're due for a pendulum swing. The the right, well, since Reagan and Thatcher and so forth neoliberalism, Americans struggle with that term because it has different meanings in different contexts, but that whole idea, you privatise everything, small government, you pay for everything as the consumer, as the parent, as the patient, and they've had 40 years of that. Mm -hmm. And look at the state of healthcare systems and education after 40 years of that. So I think we're due for a bit of a swing back. Yeah, that's true. It's true, and th there's where I think the the astrology could be helpful in that mm -hmm. the recent, like that recent conjunction in Aquarius, signals more, not less democracy, more power to the people. The Pluto cycle, which starts already a little bit this year, a little more next year, and fully mm -hmm. in twenty five goes into Aquarius. All of that, it it's it's beneficial, but then there's that other thing. The Uranus cycle, which I think yeah. it's like the last three. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, just we're right. when you think you know what's happening, boom, yeah, you you get that thing. right. But I mean, it's just the thing. If if you just realize, yes, okay, well, the last three were pretty difficult, but all three resulted in three victories eventually. That's all you can look at. You know, yes, it's, yes, it's, it's, it's and good. I think we agree on that fundamentally. Uh, to me, there's no point being pessimistic about yeah. people yeah what exactly. is the point so it if everyone just looks at what little thing they can do to make a difference and then momentum is everything in national politics or international politics it's about mm -hmm. momentum so oh look we could talk another four hours i'm sure <laughs> just, yeah, you know you know momentum momentum is such a magical word because it's true even for a person as well momentum is it could be said as the secret to life itself. You get, you know, good energy going in some direction. And yes. I like to say good gets better and bad gets worse. That's momentum. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to embrace that. Yeah, uh, totally. All right, well, it's, been, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope we can do this again soon because it's it's so much fun. You're, you're so tuned in, you know, to the geopolitical realities that it, it makes it makes it easy, you know, and a whole lot of fun. Oh no, it, it thrills me no end. And um, thank you so much for having me on, Andre. I've really enjoyed it. Likewise, I look and forward. And we won't leave it a year next time. No. No, no, <laughs> no. I promise. Absolutely not. We'll do another one soon again. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.